Tim Cromie. I'm a detective with the Dickinson Police Department, I'm starting my 29th year in law enforcement. I've been with the Dickinson Police Department about 14 years. The last 11 years, I've been assigned as the Special Crimes Investigator, which focuses on child abuse and sex crimes. My name is Jennifer Shewitt. I'm a survivor of a violent crime and victim advocate. In August of 1990, on August the 10th, I went to sleep in my mother's bed as I usually would have. And in the middle of the night, she woke me up and asked me to go and sleep in, t in my own room. I had never slept in my own bed before and went in there and got out my piggy bank and some books and started to count the change in my piggy bank as I fell asleep. Soon after, I awoke in the arms of a strange man who I did not know. His hands covered my nose and mouth and he calmed me down by telling me he was an undercover police officer. He placed me in his vehicle and we started to drive through town, passing my grandparents' house and ending up in the parking lot of my elementary school. We were still on summer break. I had just finished my second grade year, so I was getting ready to start my third grade year at Silbernagle Elementary in Dickinson. And the school is maybe two miles from where my apartment complex was located. So we were there in the parking lot. He offered me candy, which I refused, as I learned in school to not take candy from strangers, but also had learned that law enforcement could be trusted. So I kind of felt like I was being pulled in two different directions. But my gut was telling me that something just wasn't right about this entire situation. My mother wasn't one that would go out and party or ha even hang out with friends, so I'd never been watched by anyone except for grandparents. Um, he told me that my mom was going to pull into the parking lot to pick me up soon, and she never came. He started up his vehicle about five minutes after he told me that, but it seemed like it was forever. And he drove me about a mile past my, my school to an overgrown lot off of a short gravel road. And it was there that um, I started to question him being a police officer. I was a very curious eight-year-old little girl and would ask a lot of questions. So I started to ask him, well, if you're a police officer, where's your gun? Where's your badge? You know, prove this to me. At one point he told me that his gun was in the back seat. So I stood up on the front bucket seat of the car to look into the back. And whenever I did that, to try to see where his gun was located, he ripped my panties off of me. He then laid me down in the front seat of the vehicle, climbed on top of me, and started to lick me all over my body. There, after this point are times where I black out from him either choking me or trying to break my neck. Um, the next thing I remember was waking up and him dragging me behind him um, through this field by my ankles. So I could feel like sticks poking me in the back, thorns, but I just stayed silent and um, played dead at one point, not even realizing that during one of those times that I had blacked out, he had actually slit my throat from ear to ear. He laid me in a fire ant pile soon after that and then left. Um, I laid in the field for 12 to 14 hours. We don't know the exact time that I was kidnapped, so uh, we can only estimate it was about 12 to 14 hours after the attack occurred. I was found by a group of children playing tag in this field and was life flighted to John Silly Hospital, um, which is part of the University of Texas Medical Branch on Galveston Island. And I stayed there for two weeks being treated for a lacerated throat and trachea. While in the hospital, doctors said that I would never be able to speak again due to the damage that was done to my throat. And um, just being determined and you know passionate and wanting um, this person caught, I believe I was given my voice back for a reason, and I now travel and share my story, and did so um, for almost 20 years as my, my case was a cold case, and it was finally solved in um, 2009 on October the 13th when an arrest was made in North Little Rock, Arkansas. I became involved in Jennifer's case in January of 2008. Uh, the case was assigned to me. There had been other investigators. My captain was moving from our division to another division, and he had the case, so he assigned it to me because uh, it kind of fell in my, my area of uh, expertise with child abuse cases. Um, so that's how I got involved, and, and I started reviewing the case. And uh, somewhere shortly after that, within a month or two, um, I was friends with, I'm still friends with uh, Richard Rennison, an FBI special agent. He had worked in a neighboring uh, police department from Dickinson 
before he went off to the FBI, and he also worked child abuse cases, so we knew each other well, and we had become friends. So we were discussing this case, and one thing led to another. It's like, well, you, let's let's work the case together, FBI and Dickinson Police Department together, because it felt like there were better resources with the two agencies together. Richard and I, through looking through all the uh, reports and evidence, um, we found out there was a significant amount of evidence that had been collected on, on the day Jennifer was abducted and shortly thereafter, um, specifically some clothing that was Jennifer's clothing and some men's underwear and t-shirt that was found in with Jennifer's clothing um, just around the corner from where she was. So we started to focus on that um, and we sent that off to the uh, DNA lab with the FBI out at Quantico. Um, we had learned from doing some research that there was some new advances in technology obviously some 18 years later so we were so we were fo we, we focused on the um, clothing and we sent that off but we were still doing other things to see if there were any leads that we could work on. The profile was obtained and then put into CODIS and my attacker just happened to be in CODIS because of a previous offense where he um, assaulted um, another woman that was in, in Arkansas in 2000, no, 1996? Uh, 1996. 1996. In 1996 he assaulted another a woman in um, Hot Springs, Arkansas and he was um, convicted of the kidnapping portion and was um, sentenced to 12 years in prison and served four. He was out by 2000 and um, gotten married and had children of his own um, and stepchildren and he had been working as a welder up until the day he was arrested um, in 2009. So then the challenge came to Richard and I. Uh, we have this person identified as Dennis Earl Bradford. Um, we know that th we're now uh, into September of 2009, some 19 years after Jennifer's attack, and we know now that um, Dennis Earl Bradford is living in Arkansas. So our first concern was, how do you put somebody from Arkansas um, in Dickinson, Texas, some 19 years earlier? Um, and, and my concern was, is this somebody who was traveling through, um, visiting? So started to do some research, and, and we had done some research, uh, or Richard had some of the analysts at um, the FBI um, within several hours do some research, and we knew, we knew about the uh, arrest in Arkansas and the charge in Ar Arkansas and that he was living there. Um, I started researching through the local um, records in Dickinson, and lo and behold, found an arrest report for Dennis Earl Bradford. Um, actually, to be honest, I started looking through um, old index card files in, in our records room. Uh, anybody who had ever had any contact in Dickinson, and, and I, I couldn't believe it when I came across a, an index card that had the name Dennis Earl Bradford. Um, I, my heart skipped a beat. Um, and found an uh, offense report where he was arrested in Dickinson in 1987, some two and a half to three years earlier than Jennifer's arrest. So um, started to feel a little bit better about Dennis Earl Bradford being around Dickinson in 1990. And uh, I guess for about a week and a half, Richard and I did um, some what's referred to as footwork. We started doing some research, um, found several addresses that he was attached to in Dickinson through school records. Um, and, and some other things, his driver's license record from back in 1990. Um, and things started to fall into place and the, the, the ball started to roll down the hill and gain speed. So on October the 14th, 2009, Detective Chromie Agent Renerson came back to Dickinson, Texas with my attacker in hand. And up until that time, that was just everything in my life that I had lived for and wished for um, had come full circle. I was just thrilled. I got the phone call from them on the morning of October the 13th saying that the arrest had been made and then another phone call later on that morning um, saying that he had confessed but of course I couldn't know all the details of that because we were going to prepare to go to trial. Uh, I was a part of a press conference on the morning of the 13th and then um, got to kind of come face to face with Dennis Bradford on the 14th when Detective Cromie and Agent Renison brought him into the police department. Um, I was able to look at him through the, um, you know, double-sided glass, and um, he couldn't see me, but I could see him, and it wasn't a really emotional time for me. I kind of was just so interested in, like, his mannerisms and just kind of wanted to study him. I mean, this is a person that I had, you know, wanted to find for almost 20 years at that point, and 
I was just so scared of it being someone that I knew, um, and thank goodness it wasn't. It was just one of those true stranger abductions, and um, I, you know, thank God for that, because I don't know what I would have done had it been someone close to my family. Um, after that day, we just started to prepare for trial. Um, the district attorney's um, office, the staff was all there when Detective Chromian Agent Renison brought him in, and they kind of kept me informed on what you know the process was going to be like. And um, he was charged with attempted capital murder in my case, and then we were just going to wait for trial, which they told me would probably be about a year out. So close to the 20 year anniversary of my attack. However, seven months after him being in the Galveston County Jail, he um, for six months was on suicide watch. We knew when he was arrested and through the confession that he had tried to commit suicide in 1990 after my attack. And um, the first thing I said was, don't let him kill himself. I really wanted to see it through to the end and go through trial and be on that witness stand and be this strong voice and be face to face with him. And um, unfortunately, um, after six months of him being in there, he was moved without any of, of us being notified to general population. There he had access to everything. So he went from having access to nothing to having access to everything. And he made the decision on May the 10th of 2010 to um, hang himself in his jail cell. So we never made it to trial. And at that point, I kind of felt defeated. I got that phone call from Detective Cromie, another phone call early in the morning. Um, this time it wasn't a happy one. It was very devastating to me um, to you know not be able to see my case through the end. But I had to once again pick myself up. And after about a month, I just realized that like, I'm still here. I'm the one with the voice. Um, I can still tell my story and hopefully inspire others to keep going as well. And I can't just stop now. So um, I continued on and um, August 10th of 2010, which would have been the 20 year anniversary of my attack, instead of being able to read my victim impact statement in a courtroom, I drove to his grave site, which is in Texas and sat there on his grave site and read my victim impact statement. And, um, you know, that was like very rewarding to me to be able to do that. You know, I would have rather it happened in a courtroom, of course, but I loved that I was still able to, in a sense, you know, come face to face with him.